The highest peaks in the world are the most alluring to the mountain climbers, but the somber truth is that these giants are just as dangerous as they are beautiful. In today's video, we will talk about the tragic story of a Japanese woman who succumbed to a storm on Everest, an Irish climber who died heroically, saving others, and an Italian climber lost in the depths of an ice crevice. Born on February 2, 1949, Yasuko Namba was a climbing enthusiast and a businesswoman. She traveled all over the world and summited Kilimanjaro, Aconcagua, Denali, and Mount Elbrus. After summiting Vincent Massif in 1993 and Karsten's Pyramid in 1994, she was ready to take on her next big challenge, the tallest mountain in the world, standing at 8,848.86 meters, Mount Everest. By this point, Yasuka Namba was very experienced in mountain climbing and she was known to be a very determined woman. So, the unwieldy and difficult to climb Mount Everest seemed to be the perfect next addition to her mountaineering career. Yasuka was part of a group expedition, including Andy Harris and Michael Groom. Their team was led by Rob Hall, an expert climber. Alongside them was another team of climbers attempting to summit Everest with Scott Fisher as her leader. With such highly experienced and qualified climbers leading the expedition, it seemed like nothing would go wrong. The trek to the summit of Everest went well for the climbers. Yasuko Namba reached the top, becoming the oldest woman to summit Everest at the time. She also became the second woman to reach the seven summits. But the tragedy would strike as a party made its way back to camp after having accomplished the greatest desire of summiting the tallest mountain in the world. Yasuko Namba had stayed quite late on the mountaintop the date was May 10, 1996, and it was close to the afternoon. As Yasuka and her team started their journey downward, the weather conditions worsened. Before they could reach their camp, a snowstorm had started. The snowstorm caused a whiteout, making it impossible to find the campsite and possibly get shelter. The whole expedition, including Yasuko, was stuck in the storm in the South Coal area of Everest, exposed to the harsh climate, freezing temperatures, and extreme winds. Mike Groom, the guide of the expedition who survived the incident, would later say that Yasuko was trying to put on her oxygen mask during the storm, despite having run out of oxygen already. The situation looked very grim. Namba and her fellow climber Weathers were severely affected by these bad weather conditions, so they had to be assisted with their guides. Eventually, the guides came to the decision that moving towards a campsite in the whiteout and snowstorm was too dangerous. Not only would they be unable to locate the campsite due to poor vision in the whiteout, but they could also get lost or fall down a cliff. The party stopped and decided to wait out the storm. They would be stuck in these conditions for a long time. Anatoly Bukriv, one of Fisher's team guides, decided to venture out later during the night to try to look for the missing party members. He helped many of the climbers stuck in the storm. Eventually, he came back to help Sandy Pittman and Tim Madsen who had been stuck alongside Yasuko in the storm. Weathers was in such bad condition that Madsen decided he would not make it back down to the camp. A rescue attempt for Weathers could have cost the lives of others. When he examined Yasuko, Madsen thought that he was already dead. She was left behind in the storm with Weathers. The next day, a search party was organized to find Yasuko and Weathers. At this point, it was very likely that the two were already dead. But when the rescuers reached the place where both climbers had been left behind, the rescuers were surprised to see them still alive. Unfortunately, however, their condition was too critical. Both seemed to be hanging on to life by sheer will. In their current state, it was not wise to attempt a rescue as they would not make it to the base camp alive. The harsh reality was that there were more survivors at the moment on Everest who had been stuck in the storm others who may have a much better chance of surviving after being rescued. Another difficult decision was made during the unfortunate tragedy. For the second time, Yasuko and Weather had been left behind. Yasuko Namba, at some point later, died of exhaustion and exposure to the elements. She had fought to the last, but the unforgiving Everest had claimed her life. Her body remained there for now, frozen in time. Weathers, despite all odds, survived. He climbed down to the camp and was saved. However, he lost his nose, right arm, fingers on his other hand, and his toes. The 1996 incident was one of the worst in the history of mountaineering, claiming the life of eight people. 
Anatoly Bukriev would later be haunted by his regret of not being able to do more to save Yasuko. In 1997, he made the journey to find Yasuko's body. He was successful in locating the body where it had been left. However, he could not retrieve it, so instead, he raised a Karen to protect her body from the scavenger birds. Later in the same year, Yasuko's husband commissioned a party to get Yasuko's body down from her resting place. The expedition was successful and her body was retrieved. Today, two memorial curtains stand near Gorik Shep, one for Yasuko Namba and her team members Doug Hansen and Andy Harris, and the other for Rob Hall, the leader of the expedition. Connecting the two memorials are prayer flags. The story of Yasuko and her expedition would be retold in the movie Into Thin Air, Death on Everest, and Everest. Even today, her determination and achievements inspire climbers from around the world. The circumstances around the death of Gerard McDonnell are very mysterious. Born on 20th January 1971, Gerard was a mountaineering enthusiast. He was a very well-known figure in the Anchorage Irish community and was loved by his fellow Irishmen. During his career as a mountaineer, he summoned Denali and helped some climbers in trouble to safety on his way down. He was the fourth Irishman to ever summit Mount Everest. He then climbed many unknown peaks of the Askai Chin Plateau. In 2005, he again climbed Denali. With so much climbing experience under his belt, it was now time to try his greatest challenge yet, one of the most dangerous mountains in the world, K2. K2 is an 8,611 meters tall mountain infamous for being extremely difficult to climb. Gerard, however, was determined to take on this difficult challenge. He attempted his first climb in August 2006, but the attempt was cut short by a falling rock which cracked his helmet and fractured his skull. He had to be airlifted out of the mountain and sent to a hospital. He was back in July 2008, ready to make his second attempt at summoning the mountain. But heavy snowfall and strong winds halted the expedition for weeks. Eventually, the weather conditions improved until they were good enough to attempt a climb. There were many other expeditions also waiting to make their attempt at climbing K2. Gerard's expedition and the other expeditions pulled their resources together to attempt the climb as one big group. The climb began, but it would end up being one of the most tragic expeditions in the history of K2. While climbing to the summit, two climbers fell to their death. This was a result of poor coordination among the group. With such a large expedition, it also becomes more dangerous to climb through the bottleneck. The bottleneck of K2 is a narrow couloir with Ciroc's hanging above. This stretch is very steep and is considered to be the most dangerous part of the climb. So, many people climbing through this narrow path really slowed down the expedition as a whole. The death count was already at two. However, 18 climbers, including Gerard, were able to reach K2 summit safely despite these difficulties. With this, Gerard became the first Irish person to climb K2. The delay that had happened during the climb meant that when the party reached K2's summit, it was close to nighttime. The sun was going down fast, and precious daylight was being lost. The expedition had to be quicker on their way down. During the descent, another death occurred when the Ciroc fell, killing a climber. Unfortunately, the Ciroc had taken another very important thing with it, the fixed ropes the expedition needed to climb down were now gone. Gerard and his group were stuck 8,000 meters above sea level, with immediate rescue being impossible. Accompanying Gerard was his team member, Marco Confortola. Both friends were stuck in this unfortunate situation together. However, they had to take measures to improve their chances of survival. Confortola dug two pits for them to take shelter. In the freezing temperature, they both were very cold. They spent the night in the makeshift shelters, and in the morning, they tried to make their way down the mountain. During their descent, they came across three Korean climbers who were hanging from the mountain upside down with a cord attached to their waist. Left in that condition, they would die. Gerard and Comfortola, ignoring the most important rule of mountaineering, save your life first, tried to rescue them for three hours, but all their attempts were unsuccessful. In the end, they had to leave the climbers. But as they left the Korean climbers and made their way downwards, suddenly, Gerard turned around. Without saying a word, 
he started climbing back up. This was extremely strange. Confortola called for him, but there was no response. This was the last time Confortola saw his friend alive. He had no choice but to continue his way downwards, fearing for his own life. After a while, he was completely exhausted and slept. His sleep would be disturbed by a rumbling noise. An avalanche was coming down beside him. As the avalanche went past, just a few meters away from him, he spotted the body of Gerard. Gerard had died. Confortola would later be rescued and be among the lucky few who survived the tragedy. In total, 11 climbers died during the expedition, making it one of the most deadly incidents in K2's climbing history. It is not clear why Gerard suddenly turned around and climbed back up, ignoring his friend's calls. Some people speculate that the lack of oxygen made Gerard confused, which is why he climbed back up. But a more enduring theory is that he wanted to try to rescue the Korean climbers, no matter the risk of his own life, so he made his way back and died trying to save them. Gerard's body was never found, but there are plaques memorializing him, located on the Gyoki Memorial on K2 and on King Mountain in Alaska. Gerard is remembered by the mountaineering community as a brave hero who gave his life trying to save others. He is an inspiration and a hero for the Irish mountaineering community. Carl Unterkircher is a legend in the mountaineering community. The Italian boring climber held the world record for climbing the two highest peaks on the earth, Mount Everest and K2. In the same year without using supplementary oxygen, he completed both climbs within a 63 day period, cementing his status as one of the best mountaineers in history. Carl Unterkircher also made the second ascent of Mount Ganyan but what he was most known for was climbing new routes for the first time. Most famously, he was the first to climb the north face of Gasherbrum II. He also climbed Jasimba, Nepal with his partner, Hans Kammerlander. With such an impressive career spent climbing new routes of some of the tallest mountains in the world, it was no surprise when Unterkircher announced he would be summoning Nanga Parbat using a new route. Nanga Parbat, often referred to as a king of mountains, is the ninth largest mountain in the world. It is 8,126 meters high, and it is known to be extremely difficult to climb. As a matter of fact, it is dubbed the Killer Mountain because of how dangerous it is to summit. So trying a new route of Nanga Parbat was no small feat. It would take a lot of planning and determination for Unterkircher to achieve his goal. Unterkircher, 38 at the time, started the climb with his fellow team members Walter Nones and Simon Kerr. The route they were trying was a Rakyot wall for summiting Nanga Parbat. Since the group was trying out a new route, added dangers were present. It would be difficult or even impossible for a rescue team to reach them if anything bad happened. Also, there won't be any campsites available during the route. Most importantly, the route is new, so it is not attempted before. This means that unknown dangers could lie along their path. Despite these difficulties, the group set out to create history. The expedition started out pretty well. The group was making good progress. However, things were about to take a dire turn. Mid-expedition, a satellite call was received from Walter Nones and Simon Kerr. They delivered troubling news. At around 21,000 feet of height up on the mountain, Unterkircher had fallen into an ice crevice. The group had been climbing up the mountain with Unterkircher staying close to his fellow team members. Then suddenly, just a few yards away from Nones and Kerr, the snow beneath Unterkircher's feet gave away. He disappeared from the sight of his companions. The snow he was standing on had been covering a large ice crevice. An ice crevice is formed in glaciers as a crack. The crack can be just a few inches wide, or it can be wider than 40 feet. Since an ice crevice is a crack in the snow, the walls are almost completely vertical. Many don't have any surfaces to climb on. The day of the incident was Tuesday. As mentioned before, a rescue attempt would be impossible due to the incident happening away from the main route and high up on the mountain. On this new route, it was on Walter Nones and Simon Kerr to rescue their friend. At the moment, Unterkircher is at the bottom of a very steep 50 feet ice crevice. According to Nones and Kerr, his body is covered in a large amount of snow. The pair would stay and make every effort they could to rescue him. Walter Nones lowered Kerr by rope into the crevice. Kerr then dug out Unterkircher from under the snow. 
but unfortunately, they did not have the right equipment needed to retrieve him. On Thursday, a rescue party is organized and sent to Nanga Parbat, but the main goal of the party isn't to save Unterkirker. The main goal is to rescue Nones and Kerr, since rescuing Unterkirker seems hopeless. On Wednesday, Nones and Kerr make another satellite call. There is no way to save Unterkirker. They must leave him behind inside the crevice. The pair cannot descend back the way they came, so their only option is to continue to climb. Staying any longer could further put their lives in danger. They wanted to climb up until they could find a safer route out. The chances of survival seems low. As their satellite phone was almost out of battery power, they made their last call. There's no way to contact them anymore. Thankfully, during a search for the two survivors, the rescuers were able to locate their tent and rescue them. They had made it out of this unfortunate experience alive, yet without their dear friend. In the end, Unterkirker was presumed dead. His body was never retrieved. He died doing what he loved, exploring new routes to the summits of the world's tallest mountains.